Good morning. Glad you can join us for morning devotion. Our morning coffee time with Jesus as we open God's word. We allow him to speak to us through his word and allow him to talk to us. And this morning we're going to receive something. It being Resurrection Sunday, we're going to focus on what Christ really endured for us on the cross as revealed to us through the Messianic prophecy that of Isaiah. But before we get started, let's open up the word of prayer. Almighty God, our wonderful Father in heaven, thank you, God, for Resurrection Sunday. Thank you, God. We know that Father Friday, Father, as we observe Good Friday, that Father, the day that we recognize that our Lord was crucified for us. He bore our sins and iniquity on that cross of shame. We know he died. He was buried in a borrowed tomb. Father, we know that, Father, the tomb could not hold him. The stones could not keep him in the tomb. It was rolled away, and he came out the final day. The third day, Father, he resurrected just as he said he would. Thank you, God, for your mercy and grace. And as we observe these passages here this morning, may we not ever take our salvation for granted. May we become more appreciative of what he has accomplished for us on Calvary. Forgive us of our sins, I ask, and be with us this morning. These things I ask in Christ's name. Amen. The Suffering Servants, the title of the passage here this morning. Opening up here, we see our study of Isaiah 53. We've been focusing on the prophecies. A lot of the prophets of the Old Testament, the messages that they were revealed. And opening up here in this study of Isaiah chapter verse, chapter 53, we're going to see something here. We're going to see that the suffering servant, as Isaiah would open it up, and it'll be in Isaiah 53, we read that the description that the prophet here is given, Isaiah unfolds and he reveals to us here of the suffering servant. We can take a long look and compare these two to what Christ suffered in the New Testament. What he endured on the cross for us. The accounts of Jesus' suffering and his crucifixion. And we cannot help but see the compelling similarities between what Christ endured for us. And this prophecy here that Isaiah spoke of of the suffering servant. You can't help but see the, compar uh, the compelling similarities. And during this time frame here, as it's all happening, when Isaiah spoke of these words of the suffering servant, as it was unfolded to the Messiah, and the concept of what he would endure for us will be almost unthinkable. Almost completely unthinkable. When you think of what's unfolding here, and we see the writing here that the prophet Isaiah records and what he was going, and what he was writing down here, the audience and listener would possibly think that it's completely unthinkable. However, as we look back today, knowing us today, especially as this church, what Christ endured for us, what God's word tells us, we can see in truly retrospect looking back at his prophecy and think about this for a moment. We can see just how true in comparison it really was. The Messiah had not come only from heaven. He didn't only come down from heaven and live as a human being in human form. He also did something here, and God shows us and tells us what he did. He came down to dwell and teach. In the, he came down in the flesh to teach us how we are to live our life for him. Yes, he done that. But what else did he do? What else did Jesus do when he came down from heaven? What else happened? What else unfolded? He came down from heaven, lived life among his creation, took the physical form of a human being, he became a sacrifice himself for us, wicked and sinners. He experienced pain, suffering, torture. He was tempted and tested in every way we are. Yet Jesus was completely without sin. He was blameless. He gave up his heavenly seat to come down, dwell among his creation, and live life as a human being, live this earthly life, to die on the behalf of wicked and vile sinners. He knew why he had come to this earth. He came to die for us. He also endured and became a greater sacrifice. He endured and experienced human sin upon himself, the guilt of that human sin. That Why? So he would not have to pay the penalty for it. He paid the penalty for our sin. He paid the eternal consequence for sin so we would not have to, to give us a way to have a relationship with him. That's what he done. Just think about this just for a moment, if you will. The sacrifice he truly made for us. The sacrifice he endured for us. The love he demonstrated to us and for us. The debt that he paid for our sin. Not because of anything he had done, but because of what we have done. He who knew no sin became sin for us. He became sin on our behalf and bore God's wrath against that sin upon himself. 
He paid the debt for our sin. Kyle Yates once stated, who was an Old Testament scholar and seminary for many years, referred to the Old Testament of that like climbing Mount Everest. He said in the Old Testament prophecy, we see this, the analogy brings to mind the reality of mountain summits reached without reached without first doing some hiking. You can't do it and go through some very rough and difficult terrain. A lot of hiking and a lot of walking during that difficult terrain. And it's seen sometimes that during our hike, we find something though through the Bible and the question, the value of the relevance of what we're truly reading. So what do we do? Well, we see that we struggle with the first five books and the law as we see in Leviticus. Then we rush quickly through the genealogies. Quickly through them, we try to rush completely through them. It's uh, we see that fill the first nine chapters of the first Chronicles. All this unfolding as we're climbing and the, reaching the climax, we begin to think why we even began to tackle this journey to begin with, right? We, why we even begin this ascent? Why we start this to begin with? And then we finally reach the summit. The summit here, the page that's unfolded for us right here, like in Isaiah 53, we come to the great realization of the fact and the wonderful truth here that the climb was what? It was all worthwhile because we see some things revealed to us. This is more also and also more understanding and more compelling once we consider the existence here of the New Testament, how it ensures us as wicked sinners that the Old Testament summit passages become even more clear, even more than they were in understanding them to the word of the original audience which they were conveyed. So, specialized guides such as Acts chapter 8 verses 32 through 34, we see here, we know what's happening here in Acts chapter 8. The eunuch is going down the road and he's reading from the prophet Isaiah. And Philip's there, Philip's been sent to him Philip's there and he sees the chariot pass by. The spirit tells him to go over and speak to the chariot. And he goes up and he finds the eunuch there reading from Isaiah 53. In Acts chapter 8, 32 through 34, this is where we pick up right now. It says, The place in the scripture which, was, which he read was he's led as a sheep to the slaughter. As a lamb before his shears is silent, he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, in his justice, he was taken away and who will declare his generation for his life was taken from the earth so the eunuch answered philip and said i ask you whom does the prophet say this of himself or another man now we know what happened philip then began to preach jesus to him tell him about jesus and what he had accomplished what he had done and as they're going down the road he's telling him all of this and explaining to him who all about jesus and his ministry and then they come upon some water. And he looks out and says, well, here's water. What hinders me from being baptized? What did Philip tell him? If you believe with all your heart, you may. And what did the eunuch answer Philip? I believe Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God. And they commanded the chariot to stop. And both the eunuch and the Philip went down into the water and he baptized the eunuch. And then it says, Philip was carried away in the spirit. And what did the eunuch do? He went on his way rejoicing is what he had done. We see Paul records this in, Acts chapter, in Romans chapter 10, I'm sorry. It says this, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. For, the, for, for Isaiah says the Lord has believed, who has believed, says the Lord, who has believed our report. I think it's a safe way to say that we take a lot of things for granted especially in our spiritual walk with our Lord. We take a lot of things for granted, the words that's revealed to us, the scriptures that's revealed to us. We take it all and a lot of times, more often than not, for granted. That great and wonderful truth, the great importance of prophecy as it unfolds, especially like this one here in Isaiah 53, of what he has done. Why? Well, it is quoted. We see that the prophecy of Isaiah is quoted no less than five dozen times in the New Testament, no less than five dozen times it's referenced to in the spans of Isaiah in the span of Isaiah's prophetic ministry, a prophetic ministry, included the fall of the northern kingdom, 
the fall of the northern kingdom of Israel to Assyria in 722 BC. We also see the southern king, kingdom was right on its tail. It was coming drastically up behind it, and it was in danger of doing going down that same route in 702 BC. And if you study the scriptures, you will find also, however, the presence of prayers of a godly king who interceded on their behalf, that of Hezekiah in Isaiah 37, chapter uh, 37, verses 14 through 20, we see resulted as a far different outcome come for Israel at that time than what that of the north experienced. Isaiah assured the king. He gave him some assurance that the capital city of Jerusalem would be spared. He said they'll be spared in 37, 33 through 35 and it was a miraculous act of deliverance and you can read it in Isaiah 37. But with the spirit empowered inside, Isaiah spoke of a future day when Jerusalem would not be spared. A day when it would not be delivered, and a day it would come under the control of the Babylonians as they would come in and seize Jerusalem. The temple would be destroyed. Remember in Isaiah 39, verses 5 through 7, we also see Isaiah also promised something here, that the Lord was not finished with his remnant. He was not done with his remnant. He was not done with his people. He was not done with Jerusalem or his people. The Lord would rebuild the city through the efforts of a ruler of whom Isaiah named as Cyrus. In chapter 44, verses, 20, uh, verses 24, 24 through chapter 45, verse 1. But as Isaiah also looked beyond this, this restoration. He looked beyond the restoration to someone who would be far greater than Cyrus who would come, the Lord's servant. The Lord's servant is one of the most striking figures here in the book of Isaiah. The suffering servant, the most striking figure, figure revealed to us in Isaiah's prophecy here in Isaiah 53 and the reference to the entire nation of Israel. The entire nation of Israel describing the special relationship that God wanted and he desired to have with his covenant people. God has always desired to have a relationship with his people. However, we know these people, just like Israel, we find in several accounts have turned their back on God. A lot of his people have done that today. We do that on a daily basis. God desires, though, to have a relationship with you, a covenant relationship with his people. He desires to have a relationship with you. We have to be cautious not to turn and fall into the snares of the fowler like Israel has, like Israel did. We're given written accounts of what happens when we do so. God desires to have a relationship with you and with his people. The servant, the suffering servant, would carry out his tasks, carry out what's been given to him to the letter in a way that neither Israel nor any other man could ever do other than our Lord Jesus Christ. So we see number one, the servant's death, verses uh, Isaiah 53, verses four through nine. We're gonna start up first with go breaking down verses four through six. Surely he has borne our griefs, carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. Hey, we have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. Now, in the accounts here that Isaiah gives us in the scriptures here in the Old and New Testaments, what is suffering is viewed as, what was suffering viewed as when someone was enduring hardships, trials, and afflictions and going through great suffering and tribulation, what did the people view it as? They viewed it as punishment from God, that God was chastening them as chastisement for God. Right? Remember Job, righteous Job? He went through a great ordeal of suffering, and his friends come in, and his friends started casting out accusations. They say, oh, it's because of something you've done. You need to repent. You need to stop doing whatever you're doing and repent and ask God for mercy and forgiveness. You know, they felt that he'd done something against God because that's what it was often viewed as. And they told him that's why he was enduring that, but we know different. God orchestrated this. The servant was deemed to be bearing the pain and suffering during this time associated with his own sinful desires. And that's what we see that suffering was viewed as. His own sinful actions. It's paying a penalty for it, paying a debt for it. No one here would ever assume, no one here would ever assume that he would be suffering on the account of someone else for their actions. No one would ever come to that assumption because suffering was seen as something, as judgment that is being poured out for something that you had done and the wrongdoings of yourself. Now, as his disciples, we can readily see here and have a clear picture of what Isaiah is unfolding. 
what he's revealing to us here as we read about Christ and the shame of the cross and what he's done for us and the curse that he became and it was poured out upon him. Cursed is anyone who hangs upon a tree, remember? Christ became a curse for us. He bore God's wrath for us. And at this point, the prophet does not say or have in mind the way the Messiah took our guilt and God's wrath upon himself. Here we see something. We have it revealed to us in view of how the Messiah took what? He took our pain upon himself. He was mocked. He was ridiculed. He was beaten. He was scourged. And the voice their belief that God had abandoned him. They said that God had abandoned you and that he had turned his back on. He was punished and stricken and afflicted. We find this account given to us in Matthew chapter 27. Verses 43 through 44, it says this. He tripped, they were shouting down from the cross, looking up at him, mocking him. And they were saying, he trusted in God. Let him deliver him now, if he will have him. For he said, I am the son of God. Even the robbers who hung on the cross there beside of him reviled him with the same thing. They say they're saying the same thing to him. And there was a sense here that in which the servant was being punished by God, that in Jesus fulfilled God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge. We see in Acts chapter 2, 23, Peter on the day of Pentecost saying this, as Luke records it, he said, him being delivered by the determined purpose and the foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands and crucified and put to death. He told them they had crucified the son of the living God. And while he suffered tremendously and had a great burden placed upon him, being only partially right about Jesus' suffering means being terribly wrong about what it could accomplish as well. We have to be fully right of why he done what he done. Why he endured the suffering he went through. You know, we need to see what it would accomplish and what it would bring for us. Wicked and vile sinners. And when you look under the old law, what did sin require? Sin required something that had to intercede or to be to atone for our sins. And in view, what do we see Christ as? We see Christ as being given to us Animals had to be blameless during the Old Covenant, completely spotless, completely without blemish. They had to be blameless, spotless. They had to be perfect, a perfect sacrifice. What was Christ? Well, we see that he was perfect. He was blameless. He had done no wrong. There was no deceit in his mouth. He hadn't done anything. Sin had not corrupted him at all. We also see that each year, under the old covenant, that a sacrifice had to be offered. It had to be made in the atonement for the sin of the people as it would never fully atone. It would just roll it forward. It would roll it forward. It would just cover it up each year. It would never fully atone. It couldn't do that. So a sacrifice had to be made for the sins of the people. Christ himself, what did he do? He was the perfect spotless lamb of God, became the sacrifice once and for all for the sins of people, for all the people. And for this reason, we are no longer having to offer sacrifices every year of grain, oil, and animals, perfect animals. Jesus himself is the last, best, and perfect sacrifice. The Hebrew writer records this. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 10 through 14. For this reason, we are no longer offer sacrifices of grain, oil, or animals. Jesus is the last and perfect sacrifice. And every priest stands ministering daily, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man, after he offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. From that time, waiting till his enemies are made his footstool. For by one offering, he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. What a great gift for us, right? Isaiah 53, verse 5. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. Yes, the Messiah, Jesus himself, was smitten. He was stricken by God and afflicted. He suffered a great deal of pain, torture, suffering for us. But now the prophet explains why it was for us. It was for our transgressions. It was for our iniquities. It was for our peace. It was our place that he suffered. And the emphasis here is placed on it. The emphasis of how the servant suffered and what he endured on the cross of shame for humanity continues. We are guilty. 
We're all guilty and wicked and vile sinners, but Jesus was treated as though he were. He was treated as though he were guilty. He bore our sins. He bore our punishment. And punishment signals the consequence for sin, the consequence for sin that we deserved. And we know the debt of sin, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is the eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. He paid the debt for that sin. He didn't deserve it, but he paid it for us. Why? To bring peace and restore peace for us back with God. That peace is that sin brought discord into. That peace that sin brought discord and separated us from God. Romans chapter five, verse one, the apostle Paul records this. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We also find in this passage, find in the, the apostle Paul records in Ephesians, and his writings there, Ephesians chapter two, verses 14 through 17, says this, for he himself is our peace, talking about Christ. He himself is our peace who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is the law, the commandments contained in the ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from two, thus making peace, and that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you who were afar off and to those who, are, who were near. What did Jesus do? Well, he restored our peace. He restored our peace with the Father. Sin disrupted that peace, destroyed our peace with God, brought discord into it. Sin disturbed it all. Christ destroyed the enmity that was between us. He bridged the gap back. He brought it back together to bridge the gap and restore our relationship with God so we can have that relationship with our Lord where sin was at. Remember, God cannot be where sin is at. God, while Christ was on the cross, Christ was bearing our sins and God had to turn his back on him because God is a holy and 100% pure, just and holy God. And he cannot be where sin is at. He had to turn his back on Christ. Isaiah 53, 6, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. Here the prophet describes and reveals to us our need for the Messiah's deliverance. The need for his atoning work as he reveals it to us. Sheep are stupid, aren't they? Sheep are stupid. They are very stubborn. They are very headstrong animals. And we, like they, have all gone astray. We've all turned and tried to do things on our own. We turned away from God. We started trying to handle things on our own. And we can't do it alone. We can't restore our relationship back with God on our own. We can't do it. We turned against God's way, turned our backs on him. Every one of us, all of us have done this. We've all turned our own way. And the constant temptation, temptation to turn our backs on God is constantly there pulling on us to condemn your way of sin and to justify the way of sin. We all will see, we try to do self-justification, right? We try to say, oh, I'm all right in doing that. I mean, I didn't mean it that way. I didn't mean to do it that way. So we're always looking for self-justification. But when we see someone else stumbling in their paths of sin, we have no problem calling them out. We walk around with these planks in our eyes while we're judging our brother with specks in their eyes. Or in other words, you know what? We totally disregard our plank. Each one, that is us, that is all of us, have tried to go our own way instead of the Lord's way. And this is a sinful and destructive, condemned way. We can't do it alone on our own way. We can't make our own path. Jesus said that he is the way, he is the truth, and he is the life. And no man comes to the Father except through him. We can't do it our own way. We have to do it his way. For there's no other way than his and while we were all born and inclined to sin, Psalm 51, verse 5, says this, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. We also choose sin more than we would like to admit. We choose to follow down the path of sin more often than we like to admit over the ways of righteousness. Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 2, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not, he says. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? 
We are to turn from sin. Sin is a choice that we make. We choose to follow sin. It's not something that we're forced to do. It's an action that we choose to do. It's something we choose to do. Humanity's descent into sin in and of itself has always been its choice. Remember in the garden, Adam and Eve, they chose to eat of the, eat of the tree of knowledge. They wasn't forced. Satan tempted them, yeah. But did he force them to do it? No. They chose to do it. Humanity's descent into sin is not something we have no part in. We live in it daily. We make choices to turn from God. We choose to turn from God or choose to follow God. That is a choice we make. Yet the one against whom we who sin, whose law and standards we treat with contempt, and we place our wrongdoings and their punishment on the servant. Talking about Jesus. It was all placed upon him. All is repeated here and emphasized that every one of us have sinned. Romans 3, 21 through 23. But the, now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law of the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and all who believe there is no difference. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You know, and the servant Jesus Christ is what he do. He has given his life for each one of us. So now we see something. Oppression, slaughter, and burial. We see what the suffer servant's going through. Verse 7. He was oppressed. He was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before his shears is silent. Despite the pain, the suffering, the torture he was going through, the suffering that Jesus was enduring, the Messiah was enduring, he never opened his mouth to defend himself. He never tried to defend himself. He was completely silent before his accusers. Could he have defended himself? Absolutely. He could have done this at any time. Why? Because we see something here. There was nothing here that was taking place with this trial that he was going through. Nothing about the trial that he was enduring that was legitimate at all. First of all, we see that he was seized in the middle of the night in secret, in shadows. All this was conspiracy that was brought up against him. He was seized in the middle of the night, which was against their laws. They had no witnesses, so what they do? They brought in false witnesses to testify against him. And mad people come in and testify against him falsely. So much corruption here that was taking place. The claims they made against him were false claims and taken completely out of context. It wasn't anything that was legitimate. It was completely, completely taken out of context. And he could have defended himself, but he didn't. He could have defended himself greatly. We also know that any time, what could he have done? He could have called down 12 legions of angels to come to stand in his defense. Matthew chapter 25 or 26 verses 52 through 56. But Jesus said to him, put your sword in its place for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Or do you not think that I cannot call now pray to my father and he will provide me with more than 12 legions of angels? How then could the scriptures be fulfilled? He's asking that it must happen as the, that it must happen thus. In that hour, Jesus said to the multitudes, Have you come out against a robber with swords and clubs to take me? I sat daily with you teaching in the temple, and you did not seize me. But all this was done that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all of his disciples forsook him and fled. They all left him. They fled away from him. And the comparison to a lamb being led to the slaughter here emphasizes the humility and the apparent powerlessness of of a lamb. But we know that Jesus had great power and great authority. He could have done it at any time and delivered himself. But he was led like a lamb to the slaughter. A lamb could not overpower the priest and would slaughter it for who would slaughter it for sacrifice. Christ submitted himself to the authorities. He could have called down and overpowered every one of them, but he didn't. Such language did not become triumphal until the early believers began to truly understand that Jesus was the perfect spotless lamb of God. In that role here, we see that he fulfilled God's will and his plan to the letter. It was his plan. Uh, did Christ want to have to go to the cross? No. We find in the garden that he prayed three times for the Father to let, if it, let this cup pass from him. But what did he say? Not my will, but thine be done. He submitted to the will of the Father. He became the perfect sacrifice for the sins of the world is what he did. The same sacrificial lamb is worshipped 
in heaven by every creature as well that exists. Revelation chapter 5, verse 13. To him who sits on the throne, to the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. Verse 8 of Isaiah 53, we see this. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who will declare his generation? He was cut off from the land of the living. This here not only refers to the confinement of the Messiah, of Jesus himself, before his crucifixion, it also speaks to the fact that what he had no heirs. He had no he was childless. There were a lot of teachings, and there was a movie that came out several years back that was nothing but heresy in and of itself. It was nothing but heresy and false teaching in and of itself. And we see that it was blasphemous in its teaching as well because it said that Jesus had a child with Mary, which was blasphemy in and of itself. But we see that Jesus died childless. There was no one to declare his generation. For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people, he was stricken. This is the first indication in this passage that the suffering servant of the Lord, that Jesus would die. That the Messiah himself would die. And up to this point, we might think that he would have just been beat, scourged, beaten badly, right? That's what we would normally think up to this point because this hadn't been revealed to us yet. But there is no mistaking at this point that he would be cut off from the land of the living. The word cut off strongly suggests not only a violent and premature death, but also the judgment of God, not simply the oppressive judgment of men. It was the judgment of God for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Jesus was cut off from the land of the living. At what age? About 33. He was the just for the unjust, 1 Peter 3, 18-21. For Christ also suffered once for the sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, by whom also he went and preached the spirits in prison, who were formerly disobedient, when once the, long, the divine long-suffering awaited, as in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight souls, were saved through water, there is also an antitype which now doth save us, baptism. Not as the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We see that he who knew no sin, he was innocent by all means, he became sin for us. He endured God's just wrath as it was poured out upon himself and against sin for us to give us the peace that we need, that peace we need, the hope of his heaven. Where is he now? Well, we see that he is seated at the right hand of the Father right now, interceding for us. He's interceding for us. Hebrews six nineteen. This I love this passage. This hope we have as an anchor for the soul, both sure and steadfast, which enters into the presence behind the veil, where the forerunner entered for us. Even Jesus, having become high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Isaiah 53, verse 9. The transgressions of my people, he was stricken, and they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death, because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. We see how Jesus died. He died in the companies of sinners. Wicked and vile sinners, between two thieves on the cross, he died. He died between those thieves. People were on the ground looking up at him, laughing at him, mocking him, ridiculing him, shouting out blasphemous chants against him. You know, Christ hung those long, agonizing hours, battered, scourged, beaten for our sins. They had no intentions of even burying him because when one was crucified, they were just thrown out the city gates. They had no intentions of burying him at all at his death, but God had other plans for his servant in whom he was well pleased. And his son, and what he bore for us, we find that he was buried not with the transgressors or thrown out with the transgressors, but with the rich in a borrowed tomb of a rich man as it was given to him, Joseph of Arimathea. We see that, we see, we find that. So number two, the servant's delight, a sovereign purpose. Verse 10, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. And when you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days. 
the prophet here gloriously reveals to us and emphatically states here as it's given to us in the scriptures that the suffering servant, the servant of the Lord, Jesus Christ, the Messiah, was ordained by God for his pleasure. This was God's doing. It wasn't man's doing. Man had no authority over him. He yielded to the authority of man at this time as he was seized. He put him to grief. Jesus was no victim of circumstance. All of this was pre preordained, excuse me. Nor at the mercy of the political military power or might. Nope. Christ yielded to the authority of these powers. I believe that here when we also find when Jesus was at the whipping post, we know that none of his bones were broken. All prophetic uh, prophecy that will be fulfilled. And I believe while he was at the whipping post that God orchestrated each blow. He orchestrated it. He was in control. He directed each blow on his back from his head to his toes from the whip, at the whipping post so that none of his bones would be broken. It was all orchestrated as he directed each strike precisely. I believe that with 100% confidence. It was planned, it was ordained, and it was the work of the Lord that Christ submitted himself to judgment against sin to be prophesied by the prophet Isaiah hundreds of years before it would even happen. This was God's victory, not Satan's victory as Christ bore these sins. As he died, it wasn't Satan's victory. It wasn't man's triumph as he was seized. The Lord was at work through it all. He was right there. His hand was directing everything as it unfolded. And though the servant's suffering, and through his suffering here, though not in a sense that God was punishing his servant for anything that he had done, but rather what he was enduring for us, what he became for us, the sacrificial atonement for our sins. So now we see this, be sacred success, verse 11. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Second Corinthians 5.19 kind of gives us some insight that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. The Father, the Son, all work together at the cross. They all work together at the cross. And though Jesus was treated as if he were an enemy of God, he was not. He was subjecting himself to God. He was there being punished as if he were the sinner, but he was the lamb. He was performing the most holy sacrifice unto God the Father as he would offer himself he would become the most perfect sacrifice that had ever been offered or ever will be offered. Christ gave of himself the death, the burial, and offering the Messiah as he gave of himself did not end the story. The story did not end there. He lives on. He conquered sin, death, and the grave, and he rose on that third day. He lives to see his seed, his spiritual descendants, his church, us, flourish. He shall prolong his days and not be under the curse of death any longer. And the life he lives after his death and burial is glorious. It's beautiful. His life shall be prospering in the pleasure of the Lord. He shall see the travail of his soul and be satisfied. The Messiah will look upon his work in full view of what's unfolded and what has been accomplished and with the travail of his soul. And in the end, he shall be satisfied. The Messiah will not have any regrets for what he done. He has no regrets for dying for you, for the pain, the torture, the suffering that he endured. He has no regrets of any of it. Every bit of the suffering, the agony was worth it all in the end. And that's what he sees. And it brought satisfactory to his soul as a result. As in the last lines of the hymn, I say this, this is my father's world. The battle is not done. Jesus who died shall be satisfied in heaven and earth be one. I hope this has kind of given some insight of what Christ has accomplished for us on Calvary, what he bore for us on that cross of shame, what he endured for us, unworthy sinners, what he gave of himself, submitting himself to the will of the Father, as he became the perfect spotless lamb, the perfect sacrifice, the perfect atonement for our sin. I hope this has kind of given us some more appreciation for what Christ has really accomplished for us. And may we walk closer with him daily in our walk. Let's close out with prayer. Almighty God, our wonderful Father in heaven, thank you so much, God, for your son, Jesus. Thank you so much, God, what he has endured for us on that cross of shame.
Thank you, God, for your mercy, your love, and grace. Father, may we continually and constantly, Father, walk in a way that is pleasing to you. Father, in a way, God, that brings you honor and glory. Forgive us, God, of our sins and failures. May we never take our salvation for granted. May we live for you each day. Be with us, God, I ask all these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.